Jeremy Hunt has a lot on his plate as the NHS struggles with the new funding deal, but as a senior cabinet minister, he's also here to talk about the confrontation in the courts over Brexit. Uh, Mr Hunt, welcome. Morning, Andrew. Um, a very straightforward choice here, in a sense. Um, three judges have come under pretty sustained attack for their judgment in the court, and it's been uh, reiterated again by Nigel Farage on the programme today that they are somehow not independent, but they're behaving politically. Nobody really from the government has come out to defend the judges and therefore defend the judicial system. I wonder if you'd like to take this opportunity to do so. Well, let's be absolutely clear. The idea that the government doesn't passionately defend the independence of the judiciary and the sovereignty of parliament is absolute nonsense because, in fact, what we're trying to do is implement what the British people decided on the 23rd of June, which is actually to restore the sovereignty of Parliament, to uh, remove the jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice over our legal system. And the Lord Chancellor, Liz Truss, made it very clear the importance of the... Late in the day, if I may the... say so, and quite, quite lukewarm in her comments, I thought. Well, I think we're muddling up um, the democratic right of newspapers to disagree whenever they want with what judges decide. We're an open society, that's a very important. And indeed the right of the government to disagree uh, with the court's decision, and that's why we would say we'll appeal this to the Supreme Court. But what we've also said, and this is very important, is that we will respect what the Supreme Court ultimately decide. And this isn't about uh, anything to do with the independence of the judiciary, which is absolute bedrock of our democracy. It's about uh, us wanting to implement the will of the British people and uh, that's why I think the concern that we have is that some of this um, uh, processology that we're getting over yeah. Brexit is really people who actually want to stop us implementing what it, Britain decided at any cost. For some people at any rate it's more than processology and when they saw that headline in the mail enemies of the people and the three judges arraigned on that front page they didn't like it. What what was your personal reaction to that? Well, there are plenty of times when I haven't liked the tone of the Daily Mail. There are plenty of times I don't like the tone of the BBC, but that is democracy. And I would defend to the hilt uh, the right of newspapers within the law to uh, write what they like and to criticise politicians, the government, as you do on this show very regularly. And that's a very important part of our democracy. But I think what is not at stake and what the even the Daily Mail is not criticising in any way at all is uh, the importance of the independence of the judiciary. But um, what I think our concern is, is a more fundamental one, which is if you are a Remainer and you uh, are worried about the decision taken by the British people, I was a Remainer until June the 23rd, and you're worried about the impact on the economy, uh, the impact on the economy will be far worse if through some parliamentary mechanisms uh, Theresa May is forced to lay out her entire negotiating strategy. And there's a confusion here, which is very straightforward. Parliament passes laws, it always has, but governments negotiate treaties. And, and the reason that Parliament can't negotiate treaties is because uh, you can't decide an international treaty by a simple vote of MPs. There's another party involved, there's sure. negotiation, there's to and fro, and in that situation uh, you have to it's give the government easy, latitude to make a mm. deal. But where does parliamentary sovereignty come into this? First of all, as Nigel Farage was saying and others have said, Parliament decided to give this vote to the British people by a majority of six to one. And secondly, the government has said that it's highly likely that Parliament would ratify any deal that was agreed about the terms of our exit from the EU. So the parliamentary sovereignty will be there. What about Gina Miller's point, however, which is that Parliament does not have the chance to actually express a proper opinion in a vote on the kind of deal that we do with the EU. And it, you know, it could go anything from Nigel Farage was, is worried that we stay inside the single market right through to the hardest of hard Brexits and so forth. These are really big choices facing the British government. And if we are a parliamentary democracy, then it's right for Parliament to be able to express its view on those big choices. It's not the granular detail of every paragraph and subclause, but the big stuff. Isn't that, isn't that fair? It's absolutely right, and that's why we've got 30, I think, 30 parliamentary inquiries going on and why the government has said that it's highly likely there will be a vote to ratify the deal. But I think it, it's just a very important point to make that, you know, in my own case, I was a Remainer until mm. June the 23rd. Um, after that, I became a Democrat. And for people who are worried about the impact of Brexit on the economy or, or whatever else it is, the, the damage to the fabric of our democracy 
would be far, far worse if people you felt think? that the establishment was trying to unpick a decision that was made. And I think, you know, we have, I think, and we're talking about the American elections earlier in the program, I think in this country we have one of the strongest and most vibrant democracies in the world. And one of the reasons for that is because periodically uh, we allow the people to punch the establishment on the nose and say, I'm sorry, we're, we're the direction. bosses. And that happened in 1945. It happened with the Brexit vote. And it's very, very important now that we get on. And that's what Theresa May wants to get on and deliver sure. this decision that's been made. But to be absolutely clear, you're taking the appeal to the Supreme Court in January. If you lose that appeal, that's it. It does go into the House of Commons and it goes into the House of Lords in a way you don't want. And the government accepts that. We have said we will absolutely respect the decision of the Supreme Court, yes, because uh, that is the system we have, but that doesn't mean that we don't have no. the right to disagree sure. with uh, the decision that the High Court has made. Well, we, we know it'll be difficult if it does come to the Commons. The Labour Party has now said that they have red lines. Looking at the red lines for their version of Brexit, I don't think those are red lines the government could possibly accept. You have conservative dissidents, and even in the court case, you have the Scottish, Welsh, and possibly the Northern Irish governments involved too. So a whole series of things come. Your Brexit plans could get seriously jammed up in the House of Commons and then the House of Lords. We haven't even talked about the Liberal Democrat peers. If that happens, and given that you have said the British people have a right to occasionally punch the establishment on the nose, isn't the only thing that you can then do is to have a general election and hand it back to the British people and say, Parliament is stopping what you want to happen, your choice again. Well, I think a general election is, frankly, the last thing that the government wants. Uh, Theresa May wants to get on I with the job. And, and, frankly, it's the last thing that the British people want with all these very, very important uh, national decisions. And I think because of that, um, I, I think it is highly unlikely that Parliament would not, in the end, uh, back a decision to trigger Article 50. Um, you know, MPs were majority Remainers many incredibly passionate but, but you also you, have you bring primary legislation i'm sorry into the into the house of commons as david davies has suggested would have to happen it then goes to the house of lords very very likely the house of lords would be difficult there now whatever the outrage by government and many people in the country and the press that could well happen and in those changed circumstances wouldn't it be right to have an election well first of all in terms of the house of commons i think it is important to remember that a lot of the mps who were uh, remainers have constituencies who are heavily leavers and you also have highly principled uh, Labour MPs like Hillary Benn who've made it very clear that they would respect uh, a decision and indeed vote for a decision to trigger Article 50 because he too is a Democrat. When it comes to the House of Lords I think it is worth reading what uh, Lord Faulkner says in this morning's papers that it would be incredibly difficult and indeed unprecedented for the Lords to uh, try to vote down not just something that the House of Commons had approved, but something that the British people had said in a referendum they wanted to do. Constitutionally dangerous? Uh, it would be, I think, something that um, would be completely unprecedented. And I think it's very unlikely that the Lords, in the end, would decide to do that. And I think what everyone wants here is for us to get on and deliver uh, a sensible Brexit that protects the interests of the British economy, restores control of our borders, and most of all, does what the British people asked us to do. And you also, of course, have to deliver an NHS that works. And so You have talked a lot about £10 billion going into the NHS. Virtually every single independent health-related body says it's much, much less than that. It's £4.5 billion. Um, there's going to be, I think, three of the big organisations, the King's Fund, the Nuffield Trust and the Health Foundation, this week are going to say the money going in is simply nothing like enough. And up and down the country people are beginning to notice, aren't they? Well, many of these people are my dear friends and like me they are totally passionate about the NHS. But we do tend to get in the run-up to an autumn statement or a budget, a coalition of people who say that uh, the answer to all the NHS problems is more money from the government. And and I think the, the big question in here is, as you rightly say, is does the NHS have <coughs> enough money? And I think the answer to that the is, is no, isn't it? The answer to that is that we do need more resources. We're looking after a, a million more over 75s than we were just five years ago. And that's why we're putting so four billion are you pounds going in more. Asking for more money now? Well, that's why we're putting, yeah. as you know, we don't talk about uh, our internal discussions with the Chancellor in the run-up to well, uh, budgets, we're far, far less likely to get anything we ask for right. if we do divulge them. But the right. point here is that it isn't just about money. It's also about standards and supporting doctors and nurses to make the NHS into what we all want, which is the safest, highest quality healthcare system in the world. And there's lots of things we can do in terms of uh, 
helping to make sure we're better at learning from mistakes. We don't um, okay. get this huge litigation bill, one and a half billion pounds because of some of the mistakes we made. That also helps on the money front. Absolutely. We're heading into winter. It's getting colder. Uh, Nigel Edwards, who is chief executive of the Nuffield Trust, has said the NHS is going to its toughest winter yet with the odds stacked against it. Are you worried about a winter crisis this year? We always worry about winter in the NHS. It's extremely tough. Um, you know, I can say that I think we are better prepared this year mm. than we ever have been. Uh, but there's always the unpredictable, the cold spells, the, the flu outbreaks and so on. And so I know that the one thing we can depend on is NHS staff who work fantastically hard beyond the call of duty to do what they can to keep the public safe. But to be clear, we've had lots and lots of people from across the NHS saying, you know, really, really sorry, but the NHS does need more money, and you sound like you agree with them. Well, there are, of course, financial pressures, um, but I think it's a mistake to say that this is only about money. It's also about mm -hmm. getting the culture right. And if I give you uh, an you, example... You're spending some more money, I think, this week on MRSA, for instance. Yes. Um, I mean, we have had tremendous success, and the NHS can be very proud of our success in tackling MRSA and, and C. diff. Um, but we now have these really vicious bugs, the, the superbugs, the E. coli bugs, more than 40,000 incidents since a year, 5,500 people die every year. And these are immune sometimes to some of the strongest antibiotics. Are we losing control of this fight? Um, I don't think we are. In fact, I think what we did on MRSA shows that when we put our minds to it, we can be absolutely world beating in this. But it isn't just E. coli, it's also sepsis. And uh, I don't know if you've seen, there's a a film uh, that's out at the moment called Starfish uh, with Joanne Froggett and Tom Riley. And it's actually a love story about how a couple in the most appalling situation hold together. But the, so the this star... this is a man who loses all of his limbs, is that right? He loses right? his arms and his legs. It's based on a true story um, of someone called Tom Ray and his wife, Nick. And despite this incredible pressure, they hold together. It's a love mm. story, but it's about how awful sepsis can be. Yes. And one of the things we want to do in the NHS is be much, much better at spotting sepsis earlier. When we were talking just now about the winter coming on, you didn't seem to be entirely confident about the future. Are you worried about the NHS over the next year? Well, I think it would be wrong for any health secretary in the run-up to winter to say that um, everything is tickety-boo because I'm, this will be my fifth winter and there are always unpredictable things that happen. Um, but I do think that we have got fantastic people working in our hospitals, totally focused on doing the right thing for patients. And um, I think that, you know, we will get through it. It will be, I'm sure, very, very challenging. But we have the amazing resource of our NHS staff to fall back on.